Now, the, I, I have to, to admit, the only reason that I reminded Tim there about the emergency exits is uh, allows me to say uh, that if all goes well um, tonight, uh, Stephen will be sticking around in the foyer to, to sign books if they haven't been signed already and to uh, chat to everyone. But if all goes badly, then the two of us intend to use the Chris Heaton Harris emergency exit. <laughs> <laughs> and we will just disappear. You won't see us ever again. Didn't he go through the kitchen though? He didn't go through it. I think he went through the kitchen. So good evening and um, welcome everyone to the St. Patrick's Centre. I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Dan Patrick, which as Tim says is uh, part of my stomping grounds with Stephen tonight discussing his new book. Uh, that's not just because uh, Stephen is a celebrated author and an entertaining speaker, but also because he's the bloke who used to sit next to me in our office in the BBC in um, Ormond Avenue in Belfast for many a long year. Whilst there might have been the odd grumble about whose turn it was to go and make a cup of tea, I can't remember a single harsh word exchanged between us, which either means we were the firmest of friends or that we did all our bitching behind each other's backs. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it was the former, not the latter. Now. Um, I looked up Stephen Walker on the web uh, in order to prepare for tonight, and it told me he was a writer and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. So far, so good. Uh, but then it told me he'd been writing about the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin and the countdown to the H-bomb at Hiroshima. Funny, I thought. I sat next to this bloke all those years, and he never <laughs> whispered a word about these projects to me. I looked again and the photo just didn't seem right. Stephen, it transpires, has a Google ganger with the very same name operating in a very similar line of work. Next time you're doing a tour of the bookshop, Stephen, I think you'll have to see if you can find one of the other Stephen Walker's books and sign that instead. I will try that trick. Back to our own Stephen Walker. He too is a celebrated documentary with many BBC Spotlight uh, investigations to his name and an accomplished author who's written about the Irishman shot at dawn during World War I in his book Forgotten Soldiers, about Irish sporting heroes who died in the Great War in Ireland's call, and about the remarkable story of an Irish priest and an SS colonel who played a cat and mouse game over allied prisoner of war escapees in Rome during the Second World War. That was hide and seek. But tonight, we're here to talk about Stephen's latest composition, The Persuader, which has been held, as Tim was saying, as the definitive biography of the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Good Friday Agreement architect, and former SDLP leader, John Hume. Now, in a moment, I'll get Stephen to read an extract from his book. And then later on, there'll also be a chance for you, the audience, to join in uh, by putting any questions you might have uh, about The Persuader to Stephen. And I'll do my best to pick you out, even though the lights are blinding me. But first things first, Stephen, can you begin by explaining why you switched away from those previous World War I, World War II topics to a much more recent and local political biography and what particularly grabbed you about the story of John Hume? Sure, um, I, I will answer that. But first, I just want to say it's it's a joy and a delight to be here, and uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, I've I've been here before, but I've been in in Mark's shoes when I interviewed Baroness Blood and Baroness Paisley. Some of you may have been there that evening, and uh, thank you also very much for the warm welcome from Tim Campbell. And his salesmanship is fantastic. I think I want Tim Campbell to be with me on every occasion, and he definitely wins the award for the best dressed set. <laughs> Although I do feel as if I'm, we're, we're sort of taking part in, you know, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here or something. <laughs> I do hope Nigel Farage isn't in the audience. <laughs> um, so anyway, it is, it is lovely that you're here uh, in, in, in great numbers. Uh, back to your question, uh, which I have remembered. Um, uh, I, I thought long and hard uh, uh, about writing the Hume book because, as you say, my previous books were, were essentially history books. Um, and I had made a rule to myself that I wouldn't write about politics and news and current affairs because I lived at nine to five and I didn't want to come home from the Beeb and then go and do three or four hours writing about stuff that I'd been dealing with during the day. So I, I wanted a demarcation between this is work and this is sort of writing for pleasure. And um, I happened to have a conversation with a publisher over lunch and I explained my rule and they weren't entirely convinced by my argument and they said, well, look, okay, um, 
and I had my phone sitting there, and they looked at my phone and they said, your phone is full of political contacts. If you ring somebody, whether it's a unionist, a nationalist, alliance, former prime minister, they will pick the phone up to you because of the relationship that you've created with them in the 30 years. You should use those relationships, and you should use those relationships to write. So we then started a conversation about what I might write about. John Hume died. He died in 20, 2020, and I was involved in the coverage of his death. And I then began to reflect on this man's life, and he had led many lives. He could have been a priest, he, and we'll, we can talk about this in a moment. He was a, a fish salesman. He set up a, a cooperative for a smoked salmon. Um, he was involved in teaching. He was a teacher for a while. He was a civil rights activist. He set up the credit union. All kinds of different aspects to his life, which I find fascinating. I then started to reread his biographies, and I realized that the last, what I would describe as traditional biography, was 1997, which was a year before the Good Friday Agreement. So I thought there was a gap in the market. So I then started to, to do my research into him, and um, uh, then I uh, amassed a number of interviews, and I went and started talking to publishers. Um, and before we get on to kind of running through the life story of John Hume, I mean, the source material that you were then able to work your way into, it was not just picking up your, your contact book and, and, and phoning politicians. There was also this base of a number of interviews that John Hume himself had given years previously. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is where it, 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 I got very fortunate. So a, a, a publisher had asked me to go and do some work on John Hume. Not the publisher that publishes this book, a, a different publisher. And I went away and did a whole series of interviews. We got people like Tony Blair, Bertie O'Hearn, Jerry Adams, you know, a pretty decent cast list. And I presented a document to them. Now, normally, when I would write a book, I would, I would give a proposal based on who I'm hoping to talk to. I might talk to person A, person B, person C. I'm going to develop this argument and that argument. So it's a bit like a wish list. Um, whereas this particular publisher actually wanted me to go away and talk to people and come back and show him what the book would actually look like with actual interviews. So I did this whole series of interviews and I thought I had done a reasonable job and I presented him with the document and he didn't want it. He didn't want the book. And I was completely and utterly shocked. He said, no, no, I don't think, I don't think this is for me. And I kind of thought, well, you started this in the first place. <laughs> this was your idea. So I still continued to do interviews on the basis that I felt I had good information from politicians and I had family members on board and the family members hadn't taken part in previous documentaries. And then I got the most amazing piece of luck. I sent uh, an email to Gill Books and Gill Books in Dublin have a reputation for doing political biographies and I sent it to a guy called Sean Hayes. And I remember I was, in, I was in Stormont at the time, and I sent him the email on a Monday afternoon and uh, rang him up and said, look, this proposal is coming. It's far too long. It's 17 pages long. Now, that is, it, it should be about two pages. Far, far too long. I said, it's far too long. I said, indulge me. I'm just slightly showing off, OK? But just indulge me. So the next morning, I'm having breakfast. I look at my phone. And there is an email from Sean Hayes at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. And I'm thinking, wow, he's keen. And he says, I've sat up most of the night reading this. I love this. I want us to publish this. I need to talk to you. And I need to talk to you today. <laughs> and so there, from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the rejection from a publisher that I thought really wanted to do it to the next moment. So I rang Sean. We had this conversation. And uh, I told him what I got. He said, I really like the fact that you've got the key players like Ahern and Adams and Blair. And I like the fact that you've got the family. And I like the fact that you're bringing new material. And he says, but there's one thing I need to tell you. And I said, what's that? He said, if you come to us, I can give you 25 unpublished interviews with John Hume. I said, wow. How come? He said, because Gill tried to do a memoir with Hume back in 2002, 2003. They engaged a journalist to interview Hume. The project, for whatever reasons, didn't happen. The book was never published. 
But these 25 transcripts have basically been sitting on a shelf in Dublin for 20 years, unpublished. It's a biographer's dream. So as soon as I heard that, then I knew it's a no-brainer. You, you, you go with Gil. And so um, the, the interviews that you're referring to are an essential part of the book. No-brainer. Um, so let's go for the extract now. Um, we'll then talk through John Hume's life after that. But uh, I gather you got a bit from the preface that you've um, highlighted that you want to just yes. read out to us. So uh, I, I did 75 interviews with people like Ahern and Blair, and then we took the 25 Hume interviews. So the whole book is based on 100 interviews. So there is new material in there. And um, we were just having a chat before we came on with Jerry Kelly, and he was asking me, is there anything new? And, in a sense, and, and there is, there's lots new in this book. Um, and one of the dramatic stories um, that I was really struck by was a story that came from Mark Durkin. Mark Durkin obviously was Hume's assistant in, in FOIL, uh, became MLA, became MP, ultimately became party leader, and was a confidant of Hume. And I mean, outside of the Hume family, there probably wasn't anybody else that was trusted as much as Mark uh, Durkin. So I'll set the scene. It's 1992. So 1992, two years before the ceasefire, six years before the Good Friday Agreement. And Hume has had enough. He's under a lot of pressure. There's criticism in the press. Uh, there are rumblings in the party. And he really is cheesed off. And he's cheesed off to a point that he wants to resign and pack it in. And Mark Durkin told me this story. This story has never been made public before. And I'll, I'll just read a bit. So he's, just before I do, I'll just explain that he was rung by Pat to come to the house immediately. And Pat was a very calm person, and we can talk about Pat in a moment. She's an essential part of the story. But he could tell by the tone of Pat's voice that all was not well at home. So, when Durkin arrived at the Hume's home minutes later, it was clear all was not well. Pat ushered him in, and John unburdened himself. He had simply had enough of being SDLP leader. He was battered by the constant criticism, and he was convinced some of his colleagues would not support him in another round of inter-party talks. He felt undermined. He was cross with the press coverage, and he believed resignation was the only way out. He told Durkin that his 13-year reign as leader was over. Durkin listened and then responded by using John Hume tactics on John Hume. He reminded him that he always said, you don't react to reaction. Durkin argued that he should pause and think. He urged his friend to simply work through the consequences. It was role reversal. The apprentice was advising the master. Hume, so often the dispenser of logic and wisdom to colleagues, was now being urged to heed his own advice. With every response from Durkin, there came another dramatic Hume revelation of what he believed had to happen. Hume informed his assistant that as well as quitting the party leadership, he also wanted to give up his Westminster seat. He candidly told Durkin that he needed to be ready to fill his shoes and become the new FOIL MP. Durkin countered this argument by telling Hume that this was not the time to step away from Parliament. Hume had been having secret conversations with the Sinn Féin president, Gerry Adams, with the hope that the talks could lead to a permanent IRA ceasefire. Durkin made it clear to Hume that if he quit Parliament and walked away from the leadership, this will wreck everything. It was a powerful argument for peace. Hume then offered a document to Durkin, who started to read it. It was a two-page statement, about to be issued to the Press Association, announcing his departure as SDLP leader. For Durkin, it was a devastating read. The press release was incendiary, and Hume's guest knew it must not be issued under any circumstances. The two men then talked some more, and the atmosphere improved. Finally, it was agreed that John and Pat would think about things over the weekend and would not say anything publicly. They agreed to go to their holiday home in Donegal, relax and unwind, and take time to get their breath. Durkin had achieved what Pat Hume hoped he would. He had talked her husband back from the brink. As he headed for the door, 
he still had the document detailing Hume's intention to quit. Outside the house, he said his goodbyes and Pat Hume mouthed a thank you to him and held up crossed fingers. She was relieved that the crisis had been averted. Before his guest could drive off, John Hume raised his arm and told him to stop. He then asked for the return of his resignation statement. Durkin's sleight of hand had not been clever enough. The Humes headed for Donegal. Mark Durkin went in the opposite direction and drove to Belfast. He had already done a day's work, a good day's work, convincing his friend and mentor to stay the course and finish the job. Sometimes persuaders need to be persuaded too. Thanks very much. Obviously, that was um, a story that came from the point when John Hume was very much at the centre of things, SDLP leader trying to get the peace process off the ground. Let's just go back to the beginning and, and talk our way through the story as you set it out in the book. I mean, family was enormously important, in particular the influence of his father on John Hume's thinking. Yes, I mean, he, 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 he grew up in Derry. Um, and he, his mum and dad were an enormous influence on him. Uh, there wasn't much money around, uh, and money is a factor here um, because his father had bouts of unemployment, so um, money was particularly tight. His mum uh, worked in the shirt trade, and she brought work home at night to get extra money, and John would have helped her with that work and, and um, he would have um, made notes of the work that she was doing so that she knew you know, what to bill for appropriately. Um, his dad had worked in government departments before, uh, so his dad knew how government departments worked. And his dad gave John, I think, a number of early lessons. One of the lessons was about helping friends and family because neighbors would come and knock on the door and ask Sam Hume, John's father, to write letters for them to government departments because he knew how the departments worked, because he knew what language, but also, Mark, he had this beautiful copper handwriting. And so he was able to write quite exquisite letters. So there would often be a queue of people outside the Hume house. So that gave young John an insight, I suppose, into public service, into community service. And the lessons that he picked up also about not having much money gave him a fairly quick understanding of the importance of money and what money can do. And he went on a paper round. He had a paper round where all the earnings from the paper round came into the family budget. And he got a scholarship to go to St. Columns, which was a big thing. He was obviously uh, helped by the Education Act. Uh, he had to explain to his mum what a scholarship meant because she didn't understand it. She thought the family had to pay. And he was spotted by a teacher doing this paper round. And he was embarrassed because he was doing a paper round. And, and he tried to sort of hide away from the teacher. And the teacher said, no, 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 you don't, don't be embarrassed. You're actually doing a brilliant thing. You're doing a brilliant thing because you're going out, working. You've recognised that money is tight and you're bringing, you're bringing the money back. So... His parents were an enormous influence on him. And, and his dad, of course, there's the famous story. His dad uh, said, you've got to get the sort of bread and butter politics into um, perspective alongside the, the nationalist politics. Yeah, I mean, this was, a, this was a, a Hume story that he repeated and he, he probably told it to you 10 times and he probably told it to me 10 times and many of you, the audience, I'm sure have told it 10 times. This is the phrase of, you can't eat a flag. So he was out as a 10 year old with his father in Derry, the Nationalist Party were having a rally. There was an Irish trickler, and um, uh, Sam Hume turned to young John and said, you know, son, stay away from that. Don't get involved in any of that. Just remember, you can't eat a flag. And John Hume said that was his first political lesson. Gifted student then at St. Columns, and obviously there were different routes that he could take, but initially, it was to the seminary, it was to Maynooth and the possibility of becoming a priest. There was a high expectation from his parents. I mean, he was a gifted student, as you say, at St. Columns. Um, he uh, loved languages. 
He loved his books. He was very diligent. And um, he passed exams with flying colors. The expectation was that, that we would eventually see Father Hume. Uh, some in the SDLP joked that he, he wouldn't be content with Father Hume. He would have wanted Archbishop. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he went to Maynooth. And uh, again, he was a, a, a great student. He came under the tutelage of Cardinal O'Fee. And um, he uh, enjoyed a lot of the sessions at Maynooth. Um, he, but this stage was, was fluent in French. He liked to travel to France. Um, he liked the study of logic. And that may well be where he started to develop his ability to look at problems and work out what happens next. Um, but then, and again in the book, it, it is very hard to get a definitive answer to this. But he, he eventually decided that the church was not for him. Now, one can speculate. Um, he may have found it too restrictive. Um, one person has speculated that because he liked to go to France so much and he liked to travel so much, he may have concluded if, if I become a rural parish priest in the middle of, I don't know, County Tipperary or County Armagh, whatever, I'm not going to be able to take myself off to France three or four times a year. I'm not going to be able to have the freedoms that I want. And, and they, there were some clashes with people in Maynooth. So eventually he becomes disenchanted, he leaves, and then of course he meets Pat Hume and they get married and his career goes off in a different direction. Um, we'll come to Pat in a moment, but professionally, obviously, he moves instead towards teaching. History teaching. And again... In which, actually, Carmel O'Fee was quite a, an influence because he was teaching him history he and Maynooth and he was. all of the, this, he was. the sort of ideas about movements in world history. Uh, and uh, he was a very good history teacher and he had a great understanding of history. Um, but he se always seemed to bring a Derry perspective to it. So, in a sense... He was seeing the world through Derry eyes, which is how he approached um, his political life. And I mean, one of the people that I spoke to basically said, you know, John Hume at Maynooth, you know, thought like a Derry man, spoke like a Derry man, saw the world as a Derry man. He was a Derry man to his core. And, and he was influenced by O'Fee. Then he became a, a history teacher. And one of the individuals that I spoke to um, for, for the book, thought at that stage that was going to be John Hume's career. He thought John Hume is going to settle down and he's going to be a teacher for the next 30, 40 odd years, might become a head of a department, might perhaps become a head teacher. And that was his, that was the expectation. And, and I think again, Mark, and, and I think this is, this is a theme throughout the book, there are a whole series of what ifs. You know, what if Mark Durkin hadn't succeeded in persuading John Hume to stay on? What if John Hume had stayed on um, within the Catholic Church and had become a priest? What if he hadn't become a, a history teacher? What if he'd stayed being a teacher and hadn't gone into politics? So there are a whole series of, of what ifs. There's, there's one what if which you told me about previously, which was um, that he nearly became one of us, by which I mean a BBC That's journalist. Right. That's right. He um, started making films in Derry, like the idea of, of filmmaking, uh, like the idea of, of writing scripts, you know, storytelling. Again, you know, these were Derry-centric films. Um, very interested in the history of Derry, interested in emigration, um, and started to make these films. And a job came up as a schools producer in the 1960s in the BBC. Um, now, I knew about this because Barry White, um, a previous biographer, had mentioned it almost as a throwaway line. But I then inquired with our colleagues when I was still at the BBC to see if there was any documentation about this interview process, because knowing the BBC, there, there inevitably would be a documentation about the interview process. And they couldn't find anything. Now, I kind of thought, I bet you really haven't tried hard enough. I just I wasn't entirely convinced. And then about six months later, I get a phone call to say they inevitably they'd been looking for something else. <laughs> And it's a bit like being in your own house. You're looking for your car keys and you find your passport that you couldn't find, or you go looking for your passport and you find your keys. And again, so somebody was going to look for some other document and they found the Hume document. Hume had gone for this job as schools producer. It had gone to Davy Hammond, uh, very well known. He went on to be a very well known sort of musician and film producer. He got the job. 
But the BBC has this term where if you don't get a job, you're not quite there, but if another job comes up within a year, you can be considered. He was deemed also suitable. Also suitable. The Nobel laureate was also suitable. <laughs> How very BBC. <laughs> um, you, you, um, you mentioned Pat. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, a big reason why he didn't become a priest. Um, yes. <laughs> he met, yes. met the, 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 the woman he spent his life with. And not only was that very important in family terms, but she was an enormous influence on him throughout his life and a trusted counsellor as well, uh, as well as being a, a, a wonderful person in her own right. Yes, I mean, John Hume uh, wasn't a saint. He's a complex figure. He could be difficult. He could be grumpy. He could be quiet. Um, he could use industrial language. Um, uh, one civil servant said to me, there were moments when you had to realize when John wanted to talk and didn't want to talk. He talked about driving from Derry to Dublin and Hume didn't issue a word, which is actually quite a challenge. <laughs> Even if, oh, watch that lorry up front, or I think we should go left here, or can't we stop for a cup of tea? But actually to say nothing in a sort of a three and a half hour or four hour journey, I think it's, I think it's quite impressive. Um, so he was difficult at times. The counter to that was Pat. Pat was charming, full of grace, um, very good people person. And if you ever had a, a fallout with John and he, or he didn't like a piece you did or uh, he just didn't want to talk to you and you rang up and you'd explain, she'd say, look, he, he's not desperately keen on what you said yesterday, but leave it a day or two and it'll be okay. And so she would, she would kind of, you know, smooth the waters. And, and she was really lovely. And, and not only that, she had a great political antennae. She made sure that he turned up at meetings. She made sure he turned up at airports. She made sure that, 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 that he operated. He famously described her as, you know, I'm, I'm the parcel and Pat delivers me. Uh, and and that, was, that was his great line. And, you know, she was incredibly popular. And I had a conversation with somebody about two years ago about Hume's electoral record in, in foil, which is very impressive. And I was saying, you know, if you look at his electoral record, topping the poll and, and, and the vote winning, it, it's amazing. And he said, yes, it is. He said, but hang on a minute. There's one person that could have beaten John Hume. I said, really? He said, oh, yes. One person could have beaten John Hume. And I said, well, who's that? He says, Pat Hume would have beaten John Hume. And she was incredibly popular. And she cared about the role of being a public representative. And we, we have this situation whereby the Hume House would be attacked. Uh, Pat ran John Hume's office. So the house at night would be attacked with um, petrol bombs and stones. She would see the police arriving. She would watch the police arresting young men and, and taking them off. The next morning, she'd go into her office as John Hume's office manager. And mothers would come into the office, the mothers, of the boys who had been attacking the house the night before, asking Pat for her help to try and find what police stations their children were in. And she didn't blink an eye. As far as she was concerned, someone is in the office looking for help and we give them help. She said, I'm not interested if they, who they vote for. The fact is, if they're in the office, we help them. And, and if you think about that for a minute, it is actually quite remarkable. Now, uh, in terms of jobs, we've taken him through trainee priest, we've taken him on to being a teacher, but before we get to actual active party politics, there were a few other very important things in there, including the credit union, crucially, and fish. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, the credit union, um, we're all familiar with the credit union, the, the form of community banking, um, at a time when a lot of people couldn't get bank accounts, and there were real problems for people to try and uh, loan money. And it was an idea picked up from America. And he became uh, essentially an, an evangelist for the credit union. He became the youngest ever president. And he traveled the length and breadth of Ireland. And some of his students say, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for him to come into class when he was a teacher at sort of nine o'clock in the morning. And he'd been in Cork the night before, or he'd been in Limerick, or he'd been in Galway, and he'd simply driven through the night to get back to teach, because he really passionately believed in the credit union. And once when he was asked, 
what his great achievements were. Was it the Nobel Peace Prize? Was it the Good Friday Agreement? He said, no, my greatest achievement was the credit union. So that was something that, that he felt passionate about. And then you mentioned the fish, which again is another interesting story. So he's at a public meeting in Derry. He's talking about the need for investment. He, he quickly understood the need for people to have jobs, to have a sense of identity, to have a reason to get up in the morning and, 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 and survive and exist. And uh, obviously throughout his entire life, he campaigned for uh, inward investment in Derry. And he just happened to mention at this meeting in a throwaway line about the fact that here we are in Derry with the foil, with the waterway, you know, why can't we do something with salmon? Why can't we do something with smoked salmon? If we've got salmon on our doorstep, let's do something with salmon. And he hadn't thought it through. And after the, after the meeting, you know, he was challenged by a friend who said, okay, let's talk about fish. Um, if, if you can work this up into a decent idea, I'll bankroll it to, to get it up and running. So he left uh, teaching and, and, and set up this um, fishing cooperative, um, Atlantic Harvest, and he went over to England and taught himself how to smoke salmon. And they got premises in Derry, and they went over to London, and it was a unionist MP who was, happened to be dining on a, uh, a cruise ship off the coast of England, who overheard a conversation that they were having real problems sourcing salmon and he tipped John Hume off. So the next week, Hume arrives in Southampton trying to negotiate the salmon deal with the cruise liners in, uh, in Southampton. And Phil Coulter tells a story uh, when he was a, an emerging musician of being in London and they were friends, Hume coming over to stay with him. And he said, uh, he said uh, that when it came to you know, selling the salmon in London, he said, and I'm quoting, he said, you know, Hume didn't know his arse from his elbow. And um, so I had to try and give him some kind of advice of different parts of London he could try to sell his salmon. And off Hume went to sell the salmon. So it is, again, a fascinating uh, side. So, you know, had he, not, had he not gone into politics. And there's one other thing, and then I will, and then I will, then I will shut up, <laughs> um, um, which is um, bottled water. So he travels to France a lot. And in the 1960s, the, the French... Are, are, are they're drinking water out of a bottle and he sees he sees this shop selling bottled water and he's kind of thinking you know why aren't why don't we drink bottled water we just drink the water from the tap and a bottling plant in Derry went bust and he spoke to Pat about it and he said look what the French are doing with bottled water we should be doing this so he had this idea that they'd take over the bottling plant. I mean, this is the late 1960s, and that they'd take over this bottling plant and they would bottle water. So obviously he needed some assistance from people in the trade and he needed some money and he went and spoke to people and said, well, this is what I'm planning to do. And they basically said to him, are you off your head? I said, who is going to buy water in a bottle? Nobody's going to buy water in a bottle when we can get it out of the tap. So he was ahead of his time. Uh, and uh, Pat says in the book that, you know, had he, had he set up the bottling plant, she said, we'd probably all be millionaires. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, he was full of these ideas. And then we're talking the late 60s. Along comes civil rights and dairy and the crucible of what then became the troubles. And he's obviously at this stage, instead of thinking about all these different possibilities in career terms, it starts to become more and more political. Yes, I mean, he's, he's, he's forming ideas in his head, and um, he, he had, had formed a lot of ideas in the 1960s. There were two seminal articles he writes for the Irish Times in the 1960s, where he talks about consent, talks about a united Ireland, but he talks about a united Ireland having the consent of the people of Northern Ireland, um, talking about unionism, and, and, and this is this is quite unusual for a, for someone from a nationalist tradition to talk about consent in these terms, and um, and so there was an expectation after these articles that he would go into politics, but he didn't. But eventually he does um, at the late 60s, and he becomes a, an independent, 
and he challenges the, the, the Nationalist Party because he felt that the Nationalist Party were simply wrapping themselves in a, in a flag and not coming up with solutions. He's then witnessing people not getting jobs because of their religion, housing not being allocated because of religion. He witnesses gerrymandering and in a sense he is, he is fired up and then he moves into this political world and he quickly establishes himself as a thinker, as someone who's articulate, um, and a lot of people think, you know, this is a man that has a very good political future. It's quite a fluid time politically around the sort of late 60s, early 70s here, because there was actually a meeting of cross-community activists that happened in the Greater Belfast area that was addressed by John Hume. Yes. And they thought, God, this guy, we should ask this guy to be our leader. And they didn't turn out to be the SDLP. No, that's true. <laughs> so there was an organization called the New Ulster Movement, which eventually becomes the Alliance Party. So they met in the Glen Macken Hotel, and they had, had seen Hume. Hume at this stage was an independent, and they were quite attracted to him. Articulate, seemed progressive. His politics, I suppose, not a million miles away, but I suppose not completely in tune, but not a million miles away from from people within the Alliance Party. And one of the leading lights in the Alliance Party was Jim Hendren, the, the brother of Joe. And I, interestingly, I found out in the book, which I didn't know, was that Joe Hendren was very briefly in the Alliance Party. Um, I think he paid his subs, and then when the subs came round again, he, he didn't pay them. So I think that was the end of his Alliance membership. But so there was a group of like-minded people who were moving towards founding the Alliance Party. At the same time, Hume was having discussions with people like Jerry Fitt and Paddy Devlin about the formation of the SDLP. And there would have been a place for Hume within the Alliance Party. I mean, he would have been, if not leader, possibly deputy leader, but he just decided that it wasn't for him. He maybe calculated that his backyard was Derry yes. and that, that wasn't ever going to really exactly. fly then. Exactly, exactly. I think you are absolutely right. And he decided, no, this is... So the discussions continued over the SDLP, and then there is a very funny story about the formation of the SDLP. Hume obviously is a social democrat. If, if you ever asked him to define himself, he would always define himself as a social democrat. He saw himself as a European to his fingertips. So he wanted social democrat in the title. And funnily enough, he, he knew that the Alliance Party were, were being formed. He didn't know the name. Uh, and they made one last attempt to recruit him before the Alliance Party was announced, and he said no. But whilst on the phone to Jim Hendren, he said, uh, so your, your, your party's going to be launched in a few days? He says, that's correct. He said, um, would you tell me what your, your name is? Jim Hendren says, no. He says, tell me the name. He says, no, I'm not going to tell you. Okay. And Hume says, okay, well, will you tell me this? Does it have social democratic in the title? <laughs> so he was desperate for social democratic, and then they had the meeting. Paddy Devlin and Jerry Fitt obviously came from a Labour tradition. They desperately wanted Labour. I mean, some, some of you in the audience probably know this story already. It's, it, it has been well told in other places. Uh, so Devlin and Fitt want Labour. So they, have this, they agree the principles, and then they have this long discussion about what the title of the party should be. Um, Hume obviously wanted it to be social democratic, Fit and the others wanted to begin the Labour. So they agreed, after a long, long series of arguments, um, they agreed to call it the Labour Social Democratic Party. Until after about half an hour after they agreed this, somebody must have woken up and said, no, 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 this is ridiculous. We can't be the LSD party. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> That's how they became the SDLP. Uh, they reverted back to SDLP. So it was founded and, um, uh, you know, Hume found himself uh, deputy to, to Jerry Fitt, which wasn't exactly a marriage made in heaven. Uh, and uh, his political career was, was up and running and, you know, he became a familiar face on our television screens in the early 1970s. Yeah, because, I mean, they were united by having an aspiration towards... Uh you know, Irish nationalism, yes. but obviously there were those who were more socialist, those who were more nationalist, and there were an awful lot of political, personal rivalries going on within that camp, wasn't there? Yes, I mean, there were people from Republican Labour, there were people from the Northern Ireland Labour Party, there were people from previous parties, there were people who were uh, independent. So, yeah, it was, it, it was 
you know, I suppose a bit of a rainbow coalition. Uh, and inevitably with these things, there are personalities, there are personality clashes, and there are tensions. Now, whilst obviously he was managing tensions, from quite an early stage, he had an ability, didn't he, also to win over friends and influence people in high places? He did, and, and, and one area where he worked really hard, I, you're, you're probably referring to America, um, is he got a call um, that um, Ted Kennedy wanted to see him. And um, he thought, some, he thought, this is a wind-up. This is a wind-up. And Ted Kennedy had spotted him uh, from speeches that he had given, and Ted Kennedy basically got through on the phone to him and said, I'm going to be in Germany, I'm going to be in Bonn, on this date, I want to see you. And uh, Hume had no money. So Hume had to go to the credit union. <laughs> Funny that. Uh, and uh, thankfully they said yes. Uh, and uh, the credit union loaned him the money to go to Germany. And it began a relationship which was to last for decades. Eventually he travels to America, he learns very quickly, and again, this is classic Hume, he learns very quickly where the power is, who has the power, how is the power being exercised, and he builds up this long-running relationship um, with people like Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill at the time, certainly in the mid-1970s, a speaker had the ear of, of President Carter. It's obviously been in the news this week with the, with the death of his wife. And uh, eventually he persuades, through Tip O'Neill, for Carter to start to take an interest in Ireland. And Carter issues this um, statement in 1977, which if you and I read it today, we would probably think, what is the fuss about? It, it seems quite anodyne. But in the 1970s, the Americans wouldn't have said anything unless the British had given it the go-ahead. So it was very odd and unusual for the Americans to do things on their own terms. So that started um, a relationship. And it reached a crescendo in the peace process, as, 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 as you remember from reporting, whereby you had people like President Clinton taking their lead from John Hume, and that things would land in the Oval Office at crucial times of the peace process. And, you know, President Clinton would have a decision to make, and someone in the room would say, well, what does John Hume think? And that is incredible to think that an MP from the northwest of Ireland is having that influence in the office of the most important man on earth. And, you know, Hume's ability to connect with American politicians um, was amazing. Uh, and nobody, no other politician from these islands, I think, could touch him. And in fact, when people like the Tornisters and various Taoiseachs went out to, to um, uh, Washington, Hume often showed them around uh, because he knew who these people were and where they were. And unionists that I have spoken to him look at Hume's relationship with America with a great deal of jealousy because they probably wish they had done it. Oh, we'll, we'll come on shortly to the, uh, I was going to say modern peace process, it's not really that modern now, but you know, the, the earlier part of his career was defined obviously by uh, commitment to civil rights, but then during the troubles as the, that went on and on, the horrendous violence was played out, an awful lot of his career was about opposing IRA violence, and that, as you say, meant that things could be quite tough for him and for his family. I think you've got a story yeah. about his daughter in, in the book. Yeah, the, the, the family home was attacked um, repeatedly. Petrol bombs, uh, the office was burnt, the car was burnt. And I mean, they, they lived right in the heart of, of Derry. Um, when the kids went to school, they would see graffiti about their dad on the walls, Hume is a traitor. Um, and the IRA saw him as a, an opponent. Um, they saw him as a traitor. They saw him as weak. Um, and uh, I mean, some of his strongest speeches attacking the IRA are quite incredible. I mean, there's a speech he gave to the, at the Europa Hotel in the 1980s. And if you tipexed out Hume's name at the top and you asked, you know, if you asked 100 people to say, well, what kind of person made that speech? You'd think, oh, that's a, that's a unionist, because look how strong he's attacked the IRA. And it's not, it was John Hume. And I mean, uh, and, and he, he was 
implacably opposed to, to uh, violence throughout his entire life. The IRA wanted to hurt him, so they wanted to kidnap his daughter, Anya. She went to the local school. So a plan was hatched that when the kids came out of school, that they would snatch Anya Hume and drive off. Now, we're not clear exactly what their intentions were after that, whether it was to be a ransom or whatever it was. But anyway, so the, the car arrives, they see uh, the schoolgirl, they grab the schoolgirl, put her in the back of the car, and they drive off, um, and they've kidnapped the wrong girl. Uh, this was a, it's like out of a plot of Dairy Girls, if it hadn't been too serious. <laughs> no. So they, they kidnapped a girl who just happened to look like uh, Anya, who would have been, I suppose, seven, eight, nine, something like that. And they only realized that it was the wrong girl when they went through her school bag and realized, you know, we've got the wrong daughter here. So it was very difficult for the Hume children. Um, obviously, three girls and two boys. And um, Mo Hume, one of the daughters, said to me, you have to realize that for a large period of our childhood, it wasn't cool to be John Hume's daughter. It was pretty tough. Um, back to the politics. I mean, obviously, John Hume and the rest of the SDLP were key players in 74, where we had the sort of Sunningdale attempt at power sharing. Uh, he'd been always very keen on ensuring that it wasn't just an internal matter, that it also involved links with Dublin because of his Irish nationalist aspirations. And then uh, he, he, he then, at a later stage, started becoming more and more convinced that you had to bring republicanism in from the cold. When, when did that hit him that really you couldn't go with them still on the outside? I, I, I think it's a bit of a slow burn. I think there are a number of strands here. Um, he, um, you're absolutely right, he, he, he realized that um, they needed help, um, that there couldn't be purely an internal solution in Northern Ireland, that they needed help from America and Brussels and from London. But then he also realized that it simply couldn't be a solution that the Alliance Party and the Ulster and the various unionists signed up to. And he'd had a series of, he'd had a series of conversations with Paddy McGrory uh, in Donegal, who was very close to Gerry Adams, and various approaches uh, were made through Father Reid was involved in that, and eventually, you know, he realised that actually we need to bring Republicans into this conversation, and any future solution in Northern Ireland has to involve Republicans and has to involve Sinn Féin. So over a period of time, he realised that, and and he did articulated to the other parties because John Alderdice tells a story in the book where there would be regular meetings with Hume, Molyneux, Paisley and Alderdice. Um, I, I suppose you would, John, we would have called them you know, the constitutional party leaders or whatever phrase we, we used at the time. And Hume basically turned to the meeting. He had obviously been having discussions in, in public and he turned to, to the others in the meeting and said, look, you guys have to realize we can't keep talking amongst ourselves here. We have to bring Sinn Féin in here. There has to be discussions with Sinn Féin. And Alderdice said Molyneux went completely white. He thought at one stage Molyneux was having a stroke because this was just something that Molyneux just could not understand or get his head around at all. And, and so he was trying to break the political logjam, but, but he faced enormous opposition politically uh, from unionists and the Alliance Party. And as um, you and I know well, um, he faced internal party dissent and he faced strong attacks from the media. I mean, we're, we're sitting here in Downpatrick and obviously South Down was a stronghold of the SDLP. Eddie McGrady uh, beat Enoch Powell to the seat and held the seat for many a long year. And yet people like Eddie McGrady were not entirely convinced by what John Hume was up to because there was a, there was a, a wing of the SDLP who felt that Sinn Féin was sort of playing them along and weren't ever going to deliver on this ceasefire. It seemed like it was on the never-never. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think there was a feeling, uh, certainly within some within the SDLP, that they couldn't trust Sinn Féin and they didn't trust Gerry Adams. And they felt that John Hume was 
too naive and was accepting Adams on his word, and they wanted more than simply Jerry Adams' word. There was that concern that, the, that um, they were being played. There was a longer concern, longer term concern, that some were articulating that by bringing Sinn Féin into the fold, so to speak, they would eventually leapfrog the SDLP in electoral terms, which is what happened. But I think there are a number of complex reasons why Sinn Féin have, have leapfrogged um, the SDLP, and I think it's not just simply that. Um, so there were a lot of concerns, and there were a lot of tensions, and McGrady and Hume did have arguments. I suspect there may have been some industrial language, um, and I know in particular there's one story in the book which is new about a meeting in Donegal, which Hume called to explain what he was doing, and McGrady, Eddie McGrady asked John Hume a series of, of questions and didn't get the answers that he received, and there was a full-scale row in Donegal, and Eddie McGrady was so cross that he stormed out of the meeting and he drove back to Downpatrick. Um, and uh, one of the contributors of the book says that the relationship between Hume and McGrady was never the same again. So there were a lot of tensions. Interestingly, Jerry Adams approached Malin first to try and open up a channel between Sinn Féin and the SDLP because he perceived, it was the perception within republicanism was that Malin was greener than Hume. Um, but Malin didn't play ball at all. Uh, and it was, it was, it was Hume that, that established the relationship. And it's interesting when you look at Hume's relationship with um, Sinn Féin, it is a Hume-Adams axis. It is not a Hume-McGuinness axis. Um, obviously, a lot of pressure within the party and a lot of pressure externally because this dialogue, and there were at least a couple of different phases of it, was going on against a backdrop of continuing IRA violence. A lot of people were simply saying, why are you talking to them when this is going on? And yet, John Hume was single-minded. I mean, in a... Um, famous uh, exchange with somebody who used to be the BBC Northern Ireland's Jim, political Jim editor, Jim, Jim Dougal. He spelled it out. He said, I don't care, two bowls of roasted snow, which was a phrase we'd never heard before. <laughs> and that was in Downing Street. Um, and he had this ability to keep going. Um, Mark Durkin uses this word, which, um, I mean, you, you have a better command of English than I have, so you can tell me whether or not this is true. Mark Durkin uses this word of stickability, which, uh, is it a word? Uh, I think it's a made-up one. Well, anyway, anyway it'll but, do. But, but it'll do. It, it tells you. He said, Hume had stickability. He had a vision. He said, this is where we are, and this is where we've got to go. And it'll be tough, it'll be rocky, it'll be difficult, but that's where we've got to go. And he did, he did keep going, um, but, and it did... It did affect his health. Um, uh, he lost weight. He was stressed. Uh, he ate bad food. He um, smoked too much. He probably drank too much. His family saw him at close quarters, and there were times when they were deeply, deeply worried about his long-term health. And obviously, eventually, towards the latter end of his life, uh, we had the dementia. Uh, but that did take an enormous personal toll. But we now live in John Hume's world. We now live in a world that John Hume envisaged. Uh, it's imperfect. Stormont isn't sitting. Um, um, we have a long list of things to deal with, whether it's the cost of living crisis, whether it's reconciliation, whether it's financing, the, the list goes on. But, but Northern Ireland of 2023 is light years away from Northern Ireland of 1973. And, and all the things that are contained in the Good Friday Agreement have Hume's fingerprints on it, whether it's the reform of police, whether it's north-south, whether it's east-west, whether it's the issue of consent, that's part of the, 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 the Hume speak. So he did have this ability uh, to keep going, um, but it, 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 there was an enormous cost. A great relief to him when the IRA delivered in 1994 and came up with the ceasefire, but then that wasn't kind of like the end of the matter because, as we know, the IRA ceasefire broke down. There were lots of problems. We had a like, four-year period until we got a peace agreement. And also going on in John Hume's life at that stage, uh, some people thought he might make a good president. 
Yes. We get to 1997 and um, Mary Robinson, interestingly, has just been in, in the news in recent days, made it clear that she was not going to run again. So as, as us journalists do, we started to feverishly speculate about who should be the next Irish president and Hume's name came up and this story began to gather a bit of momentum that Hume could be uh, Irish president and it then became clear that the parties south of the border um, would back him and it, this thing then started to have seemed to have a bit of substance that if Hume put his name forward um, he could be the next president. Now I've spoken to a lot of people about this. Some close advisors say, yes, it was taken seriously. I know there were discussions in France when he was on holiday about the prospect of, of running to be president. Um, so a lot of his advisors say, yes, there were serious discussions and it was being weighed up. If you talk to his sons, uh, Aidan and John, uh, they give you a very frank response. They think he would have been absolutely awful <laughs> as a president. They think he would have felt constrained by Aris and Utron. They said, can you imagine dad at the Six Nations, you know, sitting through Ireland's call for the 15th time, you know? He said, with the greatest respect to Phil Calder. Uh, um, he said, he just, it, this wouldn't be him. And he said, and they wouldn't be able to contain him and he'd be bored. So they think, again, another what if moment. If John Hume had run for the presidency in 1997, and become president in 1997, would we have had a Good Friday Agreement in 1998? Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so again, another, another what if moment. Um, but certainly, if he, had, if he had run for it, he would have got it. Mary McAleese, who subsequently went on to be president, is in the book, and she says it was there for the taking. All he had to do was say yes, and he was a shoe in. That 1998 agreement was based in no small part on all the thinking that John Hume had been doing over decades about making borders matter less, people being more important than territory and so on. Um, so that his thinking infused it. Yet maybe the details were already being passed over to the likes of Mark Durkin and Seamus Mallon. Of course, Seamus Mallon uh, came out as the Deputy First Minister. So maybe it was already the case at that stage of his greatest triumph that John Hume was beginning, you know, potentially, I suppose you could see him uh, not being the details man. And was that anything to do with his health? I don't know. I think that's true, that he wasn't the details man, uh, that David Kerr, who was an assistant to David Trimble, said he looked at Hume's role during Good Friday as being like a chief executive of a company, so he had the mission statement, he knew what the company had to do, he knew where they had to go, but the, the nuts and bolts of policing and the nuts and bolts of North-South, somebody would do the nuts and bolts. I think his health was going at that stage. And um, uh, there is a story in the book where he's in a meeting with uh, Jerry Cosgrove, who worked for the SDLP, and he sat in on this meeting and there were Irish officials there and they were talking about a certain thing and they got up to leave at the end of the meeting and John Hume turned to Jerry Cosgrove and said, have you any idea what that was about? And she said, I'm glad you asked that because I have no idea either, you know? So there may have been occasions where he wasn't across the detail. You are absolutely right. In terms of the SDLP negotiators at the time, you're talking about Seamus Mallon, you're talking about Alex Atwood, you're talking about Sean Farron, you're talking about Mark Durkin. That they were doing the details. Um, and then he is slowly moving towards 1998, and then he's moving towards eventually stepping down. And then there was the decision to make over whether he would be Deputy First Minister or not. And that did cause tension with Seamus Mallon. What, what, what do you say in the book about that? Well, Seamus Mallon um, said that where you had a situation whereby Hume was leader of the party, but wouldn't be Deputy First Minister because he said his doctor had advised him not to be Deputy First Minister, but you had Malin as Deputy First Minister, he said that caused friction because people weren't quite sure where are the lines of authority. Uh, and the lines of authority got blurred. And, and Malin thinks that if 
Hume had, had rejected the Deputy First Minister's job for health reasons, then really he should have gone. He should have gone as leader. And so you should have a situation whereby the leader of the party is Deputy First Minister. That way, there's no blurring because Seamus Mann was saying, before I make a decision, do I have to go and talk to the leader of the party? And so that was, that was his argument. The difficulty, obviously, eventually when uh, Hume stands down is Seamus Mallon's wife, Gertrude, is, is not at all well and it, 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 it does not suit. Um, so uh, Seamus Mallon doesn't become leader. And, and I mean, there was tension between uh, Mallon and Hume. It's well documented. I think it's important to see it in the round in that, um, you know, they weren't arguing with each other all the time. I think Aidan uh, Hume describes their relationship. He says they were a bit like an old married couple. <laughs> he said they'd have a row on a Monday, but they'd make up and they'd be back together on a Tuesday. And um, Malin was challenged sometimes by individuals in the party about his relationship with Hume. And he made it clear, he said, you know, never underestimate my differences of opinion with a lack of respect. He said, I, I respect and admire John Hume we may have differences of, of, of emphasis. And Colm Eastwood tells the story of going to see Malin in his final months. And, um, you know, Malin always asked about Hume, always asked about Hume. So there was tension there. There were difficulties. Um, John could sometimes not be the greatest communicator, not be the greatest sharer. And that's one of the criticisms in the book of his relationship with Adams and his relationship with Sinn Féin during the peace process is he did not share enough information enough. Now he took a decision that this is too delicate and too sensitive that we can't have a hundred people knowing the ins and outs. We just need, a, and, and you can understand that, but inevitably because people in political parties have egos, there are clashes of egos and uh, there are tensions and, and that's inevitably what happened. I remember around that time I was doing a spotlight and every journalist was wanting to see the Hume Adams paper. It was absolutely central to what was going on in politics at that time. And I was interviewing Joe Hendren for something and he, he just dropped in, oh, uh, John showed me uh, the, 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 the uh, paper he's done with Adams. And I, uh, I then spent about three quarters of an hour um, cross-questioning Joe Hendren about this um, paper and what was in it and what were the key bits of it. and. Uh, he wasn't really giving me any kind of detail and I thought well, I just have to give up on that and so we, we, we ended the interview and I said you know you're playing that close to your, your chest he said no he only showed me the paper <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like that sounds about right that um, sounds about right uh, Hume didn't join um, David Trimble as Deputy First Minister but he did join David Trimble in Oslo at the Nobel prize um, ceremony. And that was one of those times we heard a lot in relation to Brexit about how important the EU is to the peace process. That was one of the times when Hume sort of spelt out how much inspiration he'd taken from Europe and the whole idea of kind of breaking down divisions between nations. Yeah, I mean, he saw, he was, as I said earlier, he was a European to his fingertips. He loved being in Europe. He loved the achievements of Europe. He, he, he saw the European Union, I suppose, in a sense, as an original peace process by bringing countries and nations together, by working for the common good and by stopping war, by not having a war in Europe. And so he, he believed that the European Union working together was an enormous force for good. And... Um, of all the posts that he gave up, obviously he gave up being party leader, he gave up being MP, he gave up a position at Stormont. You know, the one that he really hated giving up was MEP because he loved being MEP. And I think even his family members noticed this in him physically and personally, particularly when he was having a really tough time in Northern Ireland, that by the time he landed in Brussels or Strasbourg, he would almost be freed he'd feel almost regenerated. And so you're right, he used, that, um, he used that speech to talk about the benefits of the European Union. In a previous speech, which caused a lot of controversy, he described unionists as a petty people. 
And you can imagine that went down like a lead balloon in certain quarters of the community. And uh, it wasn't exactly perhaps the best cross-community phrase to use. But nonetheless, and uh, it was front page of the Belfast Telegraph, and there was an almighty row about it. He, w he wasn't a saint. Um, that, that, no, that comes no, out of the book no. as well. And I mean, he talked about the Protestant boil being lanced, which again is not exactly a cross community phrase. But the petty people phrase, the petty people phrase, lived long in unionist memories. Because when David Trimble gave his 1998 Nobel address, he said, we are not a petty people. And he waited a long time to say that. <laughs> and John Hume was about five feet away from him when he said that. Um, so yes, you're right. So he, he, and in the conclusion of the book, I talk about he said things that he shouldn't have said. He did things that he shouldn't have done. And so yes, he, from that point of view, but then, you know, none of us are perfect. Are we, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> You're still grumbling about those teas that I didn't get you a long time ago back in the BBC. Um, obviously, we've got the, the great achievements here, and then we know that his, the decline in his health kind of robbed uh, him of, uh, uh, of his leadership abilities that he'd shown uh, so, uh, adequate, so, so, so excellently throughout his life section in your book and you have mentioned that you've had the cooperation of the family and you also had cooperation of those who cared for john hume in his latter stages and that's one of the most remarkable sections of your book is the picture that you're able to paint of john hume and Derry and how it dealt with dementia and the life he lived in the care home yes um I have to just say something I have, and pay tribute to Mark. A number of journalists read the book before I went to the publishers because, A, I wanted to make sure that I got things right. And, and, and Mark, as an astute observer of Northern Ireland, was, was a very good filter for me. And so Mark did see the book before it went to publication. And also, you know, when you tell a story, it's not just about getting the facts right. They are absolutely crucial but it's about getting the tone right. You can have the facts right and the tone wrong. And particularly when it came to John Hume's latter years, I was very mindful of the family because they participated in the book. They were, he was their lovely dad. And um, I was very conscious of that. My mother had dementia uh, and it is a cruel, horrible disease. And so I was aware to some extent of the pain and the hurt that they felt um, as his uh, children, that he could not remember some of his finest achievements. He could not remember at the end being involved in the Good Friday Agreement. And that is terrible. Here is a man that changed history, can't remember his role in, in our history. And I didn't go looking for uh, people in the care home but one of John Hume's daughters said to me, would I like to speak to Amy McCloskey, who was one of John Hume's carers? And I said, yes, I'd love to. So we did an interview with Amy McCloskey and she is in the book and she talks about the love and care that John Hume got in the care home in his final months. And I, when I wrote it, I wanted to make sure that I got the, the tone right and that I wrote it with care. Um, and, and I hope I have achieved that. And Amy McCluskey talked about the love and the care that they showed to John Hume. And, and some of it is, is, is quite lovely and quite remarkable. He loved his chocolate. He was addicted to crunchy bars. So she would leave the care home and walk up to the garage on the same road and go up and get him crunchy bars and bring him crunchy bars down. And there were days when he was bright and there were days when he wasn't so bright. And, you know, dementia, as I said, is, is so cruel, but Sometimes with dementia, little parts of your brain and memory still operate almost as normal. And one part of his brain that operated as normal was his ability to sing. And we haven't talked about this, but John Hume loved to sing. He was a big pal of Phil Coulter's and they sang The Town I Loved So Well. That was his party piece and, and Danny Boy. And, um, you know, Hume, Amy McCluskey would talk about John Hume maybe having a quiet morning and, and being almost withdrawn. Um, but then they'd say, oh, we're going to go down to the day room and we're going to have a sing song. And she'd lead him down to the day room and she'd put a microphone in his hand and like that, 
he'd light up and he'd sing Danny Boy or The Town I'd Love So Well, which is incredible. Um, now, before that, before he went into the home, and again, this struck me, um, Pat, and he was living in the family home, he would go out for walks. They wanted him to be as independent as possible. And he would walk uh, into Derry, uh, uh, he'd maybe go to McGee and see people there, and then maybe he'd walk to the church, or he'd walk to the pub and he'd have a glass of wine. And, and, and if he had a glass of wine, and he would have one glass of wine, and no sooner had he put the glass down than you know, five or six men would stand up saying, John, do you want a lift? And people would like the honor of giving John Hume a lift home. Uh, or if he was out walking, a car would wind down its window and, and say, John, do you need a lift? And the city looked after Hume, which again touched me because here is a city that he campaigned for, that he fought for, uh, that he loved. And when he needed a bit of care, they returned the favor, which I thought was quite lovely. Um, and Pat didn't worry about him because she knew that people would look after him. And she described Derry as a very dementia friendly city. So his final, his final moments, and, and months were very, very difficult. Um, but he was surrounded from the family and by the carers with a great blanket of love. And that the funeral, when it happened during the pandemic, an enormously dignified occasion, wasn't it? Well, it was, and the family, again, you know, classic, classic Hume, they wanted things done by the rules. I mean, obviously we had, we had witnessed the Bobby Story funeral. So the contrasts are blindingly obvious between the Bobby Story funeral and the John Hume funeral, but they wanted, the Hume family wanted people to obey the rules. And there were very few people in the church, but, I, but the family actually think it helped them to grieve because it wasn't an absolutely crammed cathedral with every dignitary from every country under the sun, it was limited. Um, and they felt that he got Whilst he didn't get a send-off, and Phil Coulter talks about this in the book, he says he didn't get a send-off with all the bells and whistles that you would expect a statesman to get. Effectively, a state funeral. He didn't get, but, but um, there were nice little touches, Phil Coulter playing the town I love so well. And then when the cortege made its way through Derry, people came out, some, a number of people were out on the street and gave him a round of applause. Um, so it, it was a very dignified, it was a very dignified send-off. And I think... That really helped the family. And then the family got their own time um, in the graveyard where he was buried. And one thing we haven't talked about is he loved Derry City Football Club. Uh, watched them as a boy. He would, he would, in his heyday, uh, he would be able to rhyme off the teams that won various cups. He could remember certain games. Um, school friends that I spoke to said he was obsessed with Derry City. Um, he was also a very fine cricketer, by the way. And um, where he is buried in the cemetery overlooks the brandy well. I mean, it's almost perfect. Uh, and it's a perfect sort of resting place for him. Stephen, we could talk a lot more about his lasting legacy and the politics uh, that have happened Can since. I tell my favourite story before we end? No. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll allow you one story and then we'll okay, go yeah, to questions for the audience. Okay, so this is my favourite story in the whole book. I'm going to do a Paisley impression, so I want you to, you know, show me some encouragement. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> Never, my friend. Yes. Yes, brother. Very good. I like that. <laughs> so, um, uh, Hume had a driver called Don McRae, and Don McRae uh, drove John everywhere. And um, so they drove from Derry to Belfast to meet uh, Ian Paisley in his Belfast house. And they drove to the house, houses in Cypress Avenue. I, actually, funnily enough, used to live around the corner, so I know the house well. Parked around the back, went into the meeting, very convivial meeting with Paisley. I suspect it was an European business. Anyway, they come out of the meeting. Ian Sr. standing on the back step. Don McRae and Hume get into the car. McRae puts the key in the car, dead. Nothing, completely kaput. And, uh, you know, Paisley bellows out, what's wrong with your car, young Hume? <laughs> and, uh, well, he says, well, it's completely flat. Ian Jr., perchance, he was in the country on this occasion. And <laughs> <laughs> That's not in the book, I just added that. <laughs> That's not the joke. Uh, <laughs> Ian Jr. 
with his car. So Ian Senior says, Ian, Ian, come on over here and help this man out. So Ian Junior brings his car and parks his car beside Hume's car. So they get the jump leads from Ian Junior's car into Hume's car. And eventually, after about a minute, it's up and running. And Ian Senior being a, finds this like a schoolboy, highly amusing, that he's helping Hume out. Highly amusing, he's laughing throughout this entire thing. And as Hume is about to depart, uh, Paisley puts his head through the window and says, there you are, young Hume, that's real power. <laughs> and Hume, quick as a flash, says, no, Ian, that's power sharing. <laughs> Now, I, I thought that, being a cynical old hack, I thought, that's not true. That's apocryphal. So, being a diligent BBC journalist, we have to have two sources. So, I tracked down Don McRae, the driver, and I gave him uh, my account of that, minus the Paisley impression. And he said, 100% true. And I tracked down Ian Jr., and he said, 100% true. So, that is a true story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. Now, I'm a bit blinded by the lights, but if anybody has any questions, then please, now is the time uh, to uh, let me know. Um, I know there's some uh, celebrated interviewers in the audience. Ah, it's Colin at the back. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, Stephen and Mark, for a fascinating insight to, um, I suppose, one of the former bosses. Um, and it's amazing how so much of that legacy still continues. Uh, we still meet regularly, uh, as it is now, uh, up in Stormont, and uh, have done uh, in the time that I've been there. And that remark that you made about the uh, American administration saying, what would Hume say? What would Hume think? We still uh, try to live by that. But I suppose in delivering peace, which was one of the, the obviously, the main achievement for John, um, but he would have liked to have seen the politics sorted, and then eventually we could have moved towards the purpose, which for any constitutional nationalist uh, is beyond the game. But what do you think? You, you have an insight to John having done all of the work and all of the investigations. You must get a sense of how he would uh, think. Um, what do you think he would have in terms of advice for Jeffrey? Uh, <laughs> or, uh, no. What do you think the job would say to Jeffrey about what needs to happen here in the weeks ahead? That's what's known as a hospital part. Yeah, eh? well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we're beginning with the easy ones. <laughs> I hate to see the hard ones later on. Well, I mean, he, he, you know, John Hume believed in dialogue. He believed in people working together. I mean, you know, if, if he was in his prime now, um, he may have volunteered himself whether or not Jeffrey would have accepted it, but he may have volunteered himself and says, right, I'll go over to London, I'll sit in a meeting um, with Tory ministers and let's try and work this through. So he may have volunte volunteered himself as some kind of mediator, but he would have firmly believed that nothing will be achieved through megaphone diplomacy. The only thing will be achieved by people sitting down and working it out. I think he'd be ang angered and sad I mean, what we are dealing with today is part of the outworkings of Brexit. That's what we're dealing with. This is the outworkings of Brexit. And he would have been distraught by the vote to leave. He would, and had he been in his prime, he would have been, as you know, a very active campaigner for the UK to stay in the European Union. He would be angered and sad that the project that he believed was a great peace process project was somehow being let down um, and that people were walking away from it. So he'd be angered by that. He'd be angered by the fact that Stormont hasn't been sitting and that he would feel that people have been let down. That would be my guess. That would be my guess. And it's a guess. <laughs> um, any other questions? Sorry, gentleman up there. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's Jerry. Oh, Sorry, Jerry. I, can, uh, I can just make you out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you talk about the In any sense, do you think at that stage that John was beginning to outgrow the SPLP, that John Hume had become bigger than the party that he fought? Well, that, again, that's another very good question. I mean, 
Interesting in the book, Blair says that he, he didn't see Hume as, as an SDLP politician. He saw him almost as above that. He saw him as a, you know, as a, as, as a major player in terms of the peace process, as a statesman. Um, and, you know, he, I, I think there was a degree of naivety with John uh, about what would happen, what, were the, what would be the outworkings of, of the discussions with um, Sinn Féin. But I think he firmly believed that if you do nothing, nothing is going to happen. And I think the endless deaths, I think the bombings, the shootings, listening to the radio every morning of something horrendous, I think he found that so hard to bear that he felt he had a responsibility as a public representative. And he, he, would, he said this regularly, if I can save one life, one life by talking to people, then it's, then it's worth it. And, and I think he was, he was committed to that. Um, but there are very strong arguments as, as we've just been talking about whether or not he shared enough whether or not he brought enough people with him, whether or not he thought in the long term. But he firmly believed that um, people would reward the SDLP for doing the heavy lifting. He felt that that electoral bond he had in FOIL and in other con constituencies would continue to be repeated throughout Northern Ireland. And as we know, that's, that hasn't been the case. Anybody else out there? Sorry, I'm just... Uh... Yes, please. Depends what the year was. Uh, they, yeah. Well, the 2000s, yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, I, I think at that stage, yes, he was yeah. beginning. He was beginning to decline. Um, even though, and I don't know whether Mark would bear this up, but even though he was a brilliant performer, a great public speaker, very articulate, an intellectual, and very well read, he would often do an interview with you, and after you'd recorded the interview, he would turn to you and he would say. Was that okay? Do you think that was okay? Did, did that come across as okay? So there was a kind of slight sort of shyness sometimes. Uh, and, and sometimes he wasn't as confident as you would expect him to be. Um, so sometimes he didn't perform as well as he could. Um, so that, that recording you refer to may have been in his latter years. Yeah, during that era, certainly I remember there was a period of time when uh, he had good days and bad days, you know, you could catch him in the morning and he'd be really bright and then in the afternoon it was obvious that he wasn't across the detail or, or whatever and that was yeah. that was a kind of phase that went through before the good days become became sadly much rarer. You know? And Mark Durkin had a great line where he said what what John Hume can't remember we should never forget, uh, which is a brilliant line, a brilliant line. Um, anybody else out there? Who's, sorry, the gentleman over there, yeah. Very good question. Um, his, his, his relationship with McGuinness, according to the people that I spoke to, was not a great, great one. And um, he had a much better relationship with, with Adams, um, someone close to um, John Hume explained it to me that when you had lived through the troubles in Derry, um, there was no way Hume was going to have a good relationship with McGuinness, bearing in mind McGuinness's role in the IRA in, in Derry, and particularly the pain and the anguish that the Hume family had been through. So there was not, uh, they, were, they were cordial from time to time, but there were a number of incidents um, that were reported to me where uh, Hume uh, and McGuinness, uh, I, mean, I wouldn't say clashed, but certainly uh, Hume was disparaging towards him. There is an incident in the book where um, um, Hume uses um, industrial language uh, and um, asks Mr. McGuinness to go away in certain terms. Uh, and uh, there's another incident in the book where um, he's at a function in McGee 
and Hume is talking to a Dublin uh, diplomat and McGuinness arrives at the table and Hume turns his back and walks off. And it's very clear that Hume does not want to be in McGuinness's company. Now, I have to caveat the industrial language incident, Hume's dementia or state of mind uh, may have been slightly slightly different, but certainly an awful lot of people I've spoken to in Derry say that there, there was not the rapport with McGuinness um, that there was with um, uh, Adams. Uh, Presumably, uh, obviously you'd had several elections in which they'd been going up against each other and you had that kind of local rivalry until Martin McGuinness moved off to, to, to Mid-Ulster. Um, so, it was kind of it was deeply personal, maybe in a way that it wasn't with Adams, which yeah, is why. No, I think I think that's I think that's absolutely spot on mm -hmm. uh, that he saw him as a political rival, and there were there were occasions where um, there were discussions going on between um, uh, Hume and Adams and others in Derry, and Hume instructed others in Derry not to tell McGuinness what was going on. No. Are we to assume then that Adams didn't tell McGuinness what was going on? I'm sure McGuinness knew what was going on from from Adams, but I think I think your point is a valid one. He saw McGuinness as a political rival, and therefore that may well have clouded their relationship. The the, the other thing might have been almost like pure accident because um, obviously Martin McGuinness was involved in secret contacts, but they were, as we found out, you know, through various go-betweens and agents of the, of the British state that were going up in the Northwest. But actually, you mentioned him, uh, Paddy McGorry, who was Jerry Adams' yeah. lawyer, who was uh, also a very interesting go-between was actually a neighbour of um, Hume's up in Donegal. That's right. And it actually, you know, was a, was a sort of a, a, a link, a direct link between Adams uh, and Hume was Paddy McGrory and then subsequently Alec Reid as well. Um, and so th this kind of Yeah, well, a, a, whole, a whole series of things happened at, 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 at different times. Mm -hmm. And that conversation that you're referring to was in uh, the Inishowen Peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, John Hume obviously had a home in, in Greencastle. Um, which for the Hume family was very much a sanctuary, particularly when Derry was um, a hot house and the pressure was on that he had somewhere to go. And as you say, McGrory uh, met him. And Pat Hume talks about these encounters with Paddy McGrory as the Donegal conversations, where McGrory was making it clear that if there was an approach uh, to Adams, that, that essentially Hume would be uh, pushing uh, at an open door, then you have the discussions in Clonard Monastery, which obviously Mark Hume was was party to. Um, and a lot of these discussions, I mean, the, the Hume Adams had a whole series of phases, like phase one and phase two. At one stage, um, there were lots of people involved in the discussions in the early stages, a lot of party figures. And then later, um, it was it was reduced to, to a smaller amount. Um, and it's funny, I mean, there was a, there was a funny incident where um, Hume would ring, um, Adams would ring the Hume house and obviously Adams wanted to keep things secret so he rang the, the Hume house and Mo Hume, uh, John Hume's teenage daughter, answered the phone and so Adams goes, you know, is your father in? And, and um, uh, Mo would say, uh, yes, uh, who's speaking? I'd rather not say. And so she held the phone to her chest and said, Dad! It's Jerry Adams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there was another occasion where I think she'd been to the dentist and so she's had various fillings, so she couldn't really speak. And she was in the, the family home and the Humes had this sort of telephone table. I guess we all had this telephone table, didn't we? In the 1970s where your yellow pages sat there, you know? <laughs> And it was about this size. And so she's, I don't know, Moe's looking through the yellow pages on her knees and the door opens and Adams walks in and he looks at her and says, you don't have to kneel. <laughs> <laughs> and Mo said, you know, I wish I hadn't been to the dentist that day because I didn't have a witty retort because I couldn't speak. <laughs> uh, so there are, little, there are little moments like that. And I have to say, you know, without the family, um, this would be a lesser book, and, and I am very much indebted to, to them for, for taking part. 
very quickly, what was the relationship with David Trimble? Ah, good question. Good question. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because uh, that's really important. Um, well, if, you know, <laughs> Hume was a complex, difficult man at times. David Trimble was a difficult man at times <laughs> and a complex man, um, but a brave man, a brave man, um, because George Mitchell says, and I think this is true, George Mitchell says there would be no Hume without the peace process. There would be no Good Friday Agreement without David Trimble. And I think that statement is true. And, and Trimble on, took, a, took a decision, and his party took a decision, on the basis that there's a lot in the Good Friday Agreement we don't like, but I think we, we're just about ahead of the game, and, and, and it's, it, it provides a better future. They had a difficult relationship. Um, Hume um, sometimes uh, could be in discussions um, with unionists and they would find him a bit prosaic. They didn't find him direct. A lot of unionists preferred Malin. Uh, they, liked, they thought Malin was much more direct. Reg Empey would talk about going into a room with Malin. Let's say there were five things that needed to be resolved. You know, Malin would make it clear, right, I can do business on one, two, and three. Four is possible. Five's impossible. So at least you know where you stand. One, two, and three, yes. Four possibly. Five's a no-no. Whereas they, they'd have a similar conversation with Hume and they would be completely and utterly none the wiser what he meant. Uh, Trimble very famously said to a British civil servant, uh, dealing with John Hume is a bit like grappling with fog. <laughs> so they did, they did um, uh, get on each other's nerves. But there were nice moments where they assisted and aided each other. The, the, the moments in um, at the waterfront hall where Bono uh, appeared with them during the Good Friday Agreement referendum. And this is not their natural hinterland. <laughs> you know, appearing in front of sort of 17 and 18 year olds at a music event is not the natural hinterland of 60 year old middle-aged politicians. So they're, they're out of their comfort zones. And David Kerr said, you know, Hume made a big effort, a big effort that night with Trimble to just make sure that everything was okay. Keep him calm, keep him reassured. And that's quite interesting, the, the dynamic. Um, and again, whilst there was the petty people jibe in Oslo when the two, prepared, the, the two appeared together, afterwards, the, the Hume family and the Trimble family had a private party and they partied together. They sang songs and, 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 was the, there was the, and it was said to me that there were not two wings in this party, there was one wing, the, the two families coming together. So I think on occasions, you know, they, 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 they did get on, but they, they were both difficult and, and, and complex men. Um, but, uh, you know, you're right, Tr Trimble's, Trimble's role cannot be uh, you know, airbrushed from history. Uh, I was there at that party, and um, uh, I saw I saw them uh, I saw them singing around the piano. Well, there you uh, are. You, uh, you, asked, you asked the question to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just going to say I'm I'm still paying off the bar bill. Actually. <laughs> Norwegian. You bought a drink? Now that is a story. <laughs> Devonport buys around. Norwe Norwegian prices. Um, I, I think we've maybe come to a natural end. Um, and uh, oh, one more at the oh, back. Oh, yeah. sorry, hang on. We've got one more. Sorry, I didn't spot that. Apologies. Um, please. Um, you referenced earlier on uh, Clarence Monaghan and the Irish Republic. Yeah. And you They were facilitators, yes. Yes, they they were there. They they were they were there essentially as the hosts. Although um, although Alec Reid was more than that, really, well, yeah, because he, he, he was a, an activist as well. Yes, he was. It. He had been a. But but they, they they primarily saw their role as as attempting to bring two sides two sides together to try and find some common ground. And your second point. Who approached who so that the car 
Well, there was a letter. I, I think I, 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 Alec Reed, who was obviously based at, who was the redemptorist uh, based at Clonard, who, who took the main role, uh, had been uh, playing a, a kind of a mediation role for decades, really, during the course of, of the Troubles. And for instance, he was extremely important in mediating in feuds that had happened in the earlier part of the Troubles between the Provisional IRA and the Official IRA and so on. And he was often working there and thereabouts and I think had, uh, you know, recognised Jerry Adams as an important player who might think beyond uh, the terms of the conflict. So I think Alec Reed was quite an activist in reaching out and found a receptive audience in John Hume and was able to bring him in also with the help of other go-betweens like Paddy McGrory. So I, I think who, who, who reached out first of all? Well, there, there, there were letters. Alec Reed sent letters to Hume. Inviting uh, him to take part in an yes. Irish peace process, yes. was it not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The original letter was sent to, uh, and there were difficult. There were difficulties with the letters because it, one letter was sent to Malin, and M Malin didn't reply. Mm -hmm. um, and then they waited and waited and waited, and then there were there were tick tacking with Malin, and there was an attempt for Malin to come back, but that didn't that didn't happen. And then a letter was sent to Hume, but that letter got lost. So they had to send another letter to him. But those letters did come from, from Alec Reed. This is a third one. <laughs> <laughs> There's not going to be a fourth one, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go for it. Well, um, I, I've interviewed Adams for the book, and I mean, I, I, I asked him this, uh, uh, and, and so, in, in a sense, primarily, I, I'm, I'm having to use Adams's view, although you know, Hume is 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 on the record uh, as as talking about why he was prepared to engage with Adams. I think very quickly, uh, they both understood each other's positions. I think very quickly they trusted each other. I think without trust, the process was going to go nowhere. Uh, I think um, Hume being a student uh, and being an intellectual and being, being particularly someone who knew his history, understood the history of republicanism, understood the history of violent republicanism, uh, and understood the position that Adams had. So I think they very quickly established a rapport I don't think we would have had the peace process between Hume and McGuinness. I don't think personally that would have worked. I think it would probably only have worked and, and, and it wouldn't have worked between Malin um, and Adams. I think it would have only have worked between Hume and Adams. In terms of people keeping in touch uh, afterwards, um, I don't know uh, much about um, Trimble going to see Hume. I know that um, other politicians uh, did go to see Hume in, in his latter years. Certainly Bertie Ahern went to visit him. And even before um, uh, his, his health deteriorated, Hume would often go down to Dublin uh, and see uh, Bertie Ahern. They both got on very well post-1998. And uh, as I said earlier about Hume's love of chocolate, Hume had a sweet tooth. He loved his apple pie. So when Bertie Ahern knew that Hume was going to visit, he made sure that there was apple pie in his office in Dublin because he knew that Hume would want some apple pie. And he would come down and he'd spend the day um, in Dublin with Bertie and they'd have lots of cups of tea and occasionally something stronger uh, and slices of apple pie. And he'd put them on the bus back to Derry but there was one occasion where Hume missed the bus and Ahern had to get his driver 
to drive him all the way back to Derry because he felt a responsibility to get John Hume. And so I think a government car was used to drive John Hume after his 15 slices of apple pie uh, back to Derry. Any other questions? No, no. <laughs> oh, we got one other. Sorry. What about the role of uh, St. Colin's College in London, Derry? I mean, it must have. I mean, it must have been a formative influence. It's quite a famous school, isn't it? So, is there much uh, sense of that influence? Of, uh, you know, prior to where they Yeah, I mean, I think um, it 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 helped. Hume come out of his, his shell and it helped him to blossom. I mean, he, he, he blossomed as a student. He loved studying. And uh, I mean, I think he was, well, we know he was a model student at Maynooth, but he had started that journey at St. Columns. And I think, you know, without St. Columns, Hume wouldn't have gone to Maynooth. Um, so in a sense, educationally, that was the that was the big start of his journey, and they are incredibly, you know, they're incredibly proud of 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 Hume and his contribution there. And I mean, they have produced a long list of people, you know, James Heaney. Uh, they've produced Phil Calder, a whole list of people from that from from that school. And I think his introduction at St. Columns to English, to French, and to history, basically helped him become the man that he was. I think there might be a raffle about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, whoa. Well, can I, uh, can I thank you both very much for your contributions tonight, Mark? You've been a wonderful interviewer, as always, as always. And Stephen, congratulations on the on the seminal work. Uh, it's wonderful, and uh, to be able to hear all the stories, the insight that you bring from all your many years in journalism, and from talking to a hundred. People having a hundred interviews for this. Congratulations. So, Thank yes, you. please give them a round. Well done. We're just getting a little chilly.